and then Matt is going to come forward to preach. So the reading is from Isaiah chapter 52 on to 53, beginning at verse 13 of chapter 52. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offering his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after the suffering of his soul he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities therefore I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, everybody. You all right? Good, good. It's always weird, isn't it, walking across? You don't know when to go because I don't want to distract Rita, but we've made it. Um, let me say a prayer as we start. Let me say a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for these ancient words that may be very familiar to some of us. We thank you so much that we're going to hear of your glorious son, your great servant, Jesus. Please help us as we hear of him now and his death on the cross. Please would you change our hearts and our minds. Please help us to fall in love with Jesus, either for the first time or to fall back in love with him for the hundredth time. We ask that you do that in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I didn't say I'm Matt. I'm part of the team here. Um, it's lovely to see you. I don't get to see people in the morning much because normally I'm helping with the kids and the youth stuff over there. So it's great joy to be with you this morning. But let me just tell you about my grandpops. Okay, my grandpops was a great artist. In fact, here's a picture, I think, on the screen. There you go. Now, so my wife doesn't really like this picture, but I love it. It's a great, I think it's a great picture. Anyway, he's a great, he was a great artist. He's good, yeah, good. Um, 
And before photos, if you're young, you might not believe this, but before photos, um, people like my grandpots would be asked to draw machinery to go in like catalogues and magazines so people would see what they were buying. So he would draw the pictures of machinery. That was his specialty, so that people knew the products that they were getting. He was a very good artist. Thanks, Dirk. Um, but anyway, when I was small, I used to go to his house, um, and we used to play a game. He'd get a big blank piece of paper, and he'd start painting a picture, just a couple of strokes at a time. And the game would be, then he would stop, and I would have to guess what he was drawing. And they're always sort of little clues, but I could never quite see what it was. And then there was a moment, there was always a moment with one or two more brush strokes, and the picture became perfectly clear. I could see exactly what it was. But even though it became perfectly clear, it was never what I expected. Maybe he turned the piece of paper around or he did something, and it was never what I actually expected. And look, I'm telling you this because I think it's been like that in the book of Isaiah over these last weeks and months. If you're not here, if you haven't been here for that, don't worry, but over those weeks and months, God has been painting us a picture of this man, the servant of the Lord. And brushstroke by brushstroke, chapter by chapter, we've started to see more of who this servant is, more of what he's going to do. We've seen that he's for all people, all nations, this servant. He's going to bring people back into relationship with God. He's going to lead them home. He's going to bring them joy and salvation, we heard last week. But you see, the picture hasn't been finished. We don't know how he's going to do that. We've still got lots of questions. How on earth is the servant of the Lord going to deal with God's wrath at sinful people, with God's calm and considered anger at the wicked in people's hearts? How is the servant of the Lord, how is he going to deal with that? See, last week we read in chapter 52, verse 10, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations. God is going to roll up his sleeves and act. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Well, what is going to happen? When God rolls up his sleeves, when God acts through his servant, what is it going to look like? How on earth is the servant going to deal with all of these issues that we've been seeing? Well, the answer is in the verses we're looking at this morning, chapter 52 and 53. These are the brushstrokes that finish the picture. At last, we're going to see 52 verse 13. Have a look down. Make sure you've still got it open in front of you so you can follow along. 52 verse 13. Someone shout a page number. 740 if you shut it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And at the start, 52 verse 13 says, see, God is speaking through his eye. My servant will act wisely. We're going to see what happens when God steps in to deal with the problem of sin. How is he going to deal with God's wrath? That is what we're going to see this morning. And just like with my grandpops, as the picture is finished, although we can see it clearly, it is not what we might have expected. See, this is the fourth song. They're called the fourth servant songs. And this is the fourth and final song about God's servant. And it's in five parts with three verses each. But don't fear, it's not going to be a five-part sermon, I promise you. Okay, we're going to clump a few bits together. But as we go through, we're going to see some amazing things. We're going to see that God's victorious servant will look weak. Keep that up, Dirk, but I'm going to say the others. Then we're going to see that God's innocent servant willingly took our place and finally we're going to see that God's righteous servant will save many God's righteous servant will save many but firstly chapters 52 13 just a, six verses down to 53 verse 3 we see that God's victorious servant will look weak and ordinary now we know don't we God's people are in exile that means they've been cast out of their land and they're prisoners in Babylon. And that is because of their sin. They've not listened to God's warnings, and they've been sent away from him out of his presence. But can you imagine their sort of anticipation and excitement as they're hearing about this servant of the Lord who is going to step in to save them? And 52.13, see my servant will act wisely. Finally, they're thinking, he's going to do it. God's going to reveal his arm, 
and he's going to save us. He's going to act wisely. You can imagine them being excited that God's going to come in his mighty strength and bat away the enemies. Destroy the enemy. But then Isaiah carries on, and it's not what we would expect. Just have a, have a look down again with me, because Isaiah describes this servant in detail. Verse 14, 52, 14. People were appalled at him. He's disfigured and marred. There's no beauty about him at all. He's despised and rejected. A man who knows sorrow and suffering, familiar with pain. A man, if you were to look at him or walk past him in the street, you'd think there's nothing special about him at all. He's held in low esteem. Isaiah says in 53 verse 1, who would believe our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, when this man turns up, who would have guessed this is the arm of the Lord working and acting? Not us, you'd walk past him. He wasn't impressive by the world standard, far from it. God's servant looks weak and ordinary. But as Tim said, these words were written 2,700 years ago. We're the privilege of being the other side of the servant actually turning up. The servant of the Lord has appeared in history. And we can see that these words are true. In the world's eyes, Jesus looked weak and ordinary. Do you remember when Philip, Philip, he, he ran to a man called Nathaniel, said, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah, the servant of the Lord, the one who the prophets wrote about. He's here, Jesus of Nazareth. Do you, what, do you remember what Nathaniel replied? He went, Nazareth? Really? Can anything good come from there? We know that place. The servant of the Lord, he can't come from there. Jeez, he was totally overlooked, Jesus. He was rejected. He was beaten. He knew sorrow and pain. 52.13, ready, says the servant will be raised and lifted up. He will be highly exalted. And Jesus was, but not on a fancy throne. He was raised and lifted up, highly exalted, where? On the cross, where people were appalled at him, and they shouted insults at him and taunted him. Let him save himself if he's the Christ, the chosen one. You see, what Isaiah said did actually happen 700 years later. We can trust these words are true. Jesus the servant came and to many he looked weak and ordinary. But here's the gem ready. Start of verse 15, we get a little glimpse that he wasn't just weak and ordinary. You see, he comes in God's perfect wisdom. And God's perfect wisdom is always to use what is weak to bring about great victory. That has been his MO for the whole of history. Do you remember Joseph, youngest of 12 brothers, hated by his brothers, thrown into a well, sold into slavery, trapped in prison? What did God do through him? Well, he saved many nations and many people. Or Moses, you know, Moses orphan, put in a basket down the river, raised up to be a stuttering, stammering murderer who didn't know where he belonged. What did God do through him in that weakness? He led his people in the greatest rescue of the Old Testament. Or do you remember Jericho, that walled city as God's people had to walk through? How was Jericho defeated? How was victory had? By some marching in a circle and some trumpets and the faith of a prostitute woman. God uses weak things to bring great victories. That is what he does in his wisdom, and it's no different with his servant Jesus. As Jesus is raised high and exalted on the cross, many will look and be appalled by him. They'll just think it's a weak man dying for nothing. But, have a look at verse 15. God gives us that glimpse of victory. He will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Nations are going to be washed clean because of what Jesus has done. Kings will be speechless. People will see and understand. In what looks like Jesus' weakest moment on the cross, it is actually God's mightiest victory. His power to save sinners. 
And it starts immediately. I don't know if you know, you know, the Roman centurion, do you remember him? As he watched Jesus die, his job was to make sure Jesus did die. But as he watched Jesus die, he praised God, saying, surely this was the son of God. Surely this man was righteous. On the screen, a guy called Paul in the New Testament writes this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Some will look at the cross and say, it's just weak. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is where we see God's mighty hand at work most clearly as Jesus dies on the cross. So I guess my question for you is, what do you, what do you see when you look at the cross? Do you just see something weak and insignificant, not worth your time? Or do you see that there's actually a load more going on than meets the eye? In fact, the cross is where a mighty victory is won. Have a look at 50 verse 15 again. It could be translated this way. So will many nations marvel at him. You see, even though it might look weak to the world, we are to unashamedly marvel at the cross and be astonished by it. That the God with all might and power would become weak to die on a cross for you and me. Do you, do you marvel at the cross? Do you spend time each week, each day, looking at the cross and seeing that in his weakness, Jesus wins a mighty victory. Well, look, but we're still left with the question, aren't we? How? How on earth does Jesus being lifted up on a cross for all to see and dying bring victory? How does it deal with Israel's problem of sin? How is that a comfort to people who are under God's right-considered calm anger because of the way they've behaved. Well, in the next two sections, we get the answer. So 53 um, verses four to nine, and we see that God's servant willingly took our place. God's innocent servant willingly took our place. Now you've got to do a bit of work here. So cast your minds down, 53 verses four to six, right? This is right in the middle of our passage. I want you to count how many swaps there are, okay? So how many him for R or he for us, okay? I'll read it and you count how many swaps take place in these three verses. Here we go, I'll read it out. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Come on, what have you got? What have you got? Eight, it's good, pardon? Five, oh, five, eight, I had seven. That's a lot though, right? There's a lot, there's a lot of swaps. I was waiting for seven. Don't worry if you were better than me and got eight. Anyway, seven swaps. Okay, there are seven swaps. It's really clear. It's really clear. Isaiah is saying it's him, the servant for us. But, but the first time I'd sort of read it and thought seven swaps, this is strange. But all I could think of was, you know, when you do your online food shop and they bring it to your door and you open it and the man goes, oh, I'm really sorry, but we've got seven swaps today. That's, that's rubbish, isn't it? You think, well, you're a massive supermarket. Have you not got the seven things I've ordered? But you've got seven swaps, okay? That's all I could think. It's a bit strange, but that's all I could think. But, you know, when those swaps come, you've ordered something, they don't have it, so they give you something else, okay? And you either have to receive that swap, say yes and grab hold of it, or you say, ah, no, I don't want it. Take it away. Take it back to the shop. You receive it or you reject it. And we know when it's a good swap. Yeah, we do, don't we? So like, if you order ice cream and they've just gone in the freezer, there's no ice cream, but the frozen peas are there and they put it in and they say, ah, oh, really sorry, we didn't have ice cream, but here's some frozen peas. You go, take it back. Who wants frozen peas? Nobody. In fact, actually Hannah earlier said, yeah, I'd have frozen peas. And so anyway, don't want frozen peas instead of ice cream. That's a bad swap. But we also know a good swap, right? So when you order the cheap sausages, because it's been a, you know, an expensive month and they say, oh, I'm really sorry, we ran out of the cheap sausages. 
before you've got the good ones. Would you like those instead? You go, yeah. And you grab them and take them in and you enjoy them. We know a good swap. We know a bad swap. You receive it or you reject it. But what's the swap on offer here? It's the servant of the Lord in our place. But, but what? What is he doing in our place? What did you see? He took our pain. He bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions, for when we thought we know better than to follow God's law. He was crushed for our iniquities, for those deep, awful thoughts in your heart and mind that you shared with nobody. He was punished for that so that we could have peace. He took those wounds that we deserve so that we could be healed. All of it was laid on him at the cross. Just quietly, just quietly for a second, I want you to think of, if you can, the single worst thing you've ever done or thought. What is it? Don't tell me. What's the single worst thing you've ever done or thought? It, it might be recent. It might have been quite a while ago. But I wonder, can you remember the guilt and the shame that you felt after it happened? Can you remember it feeling like it was crushing you down? What you just thought or done or said? Do you remember the shame of feeling, oh, that, that is what I'm really like. And it really isn't pretty. Well, the swap is that Jesus says, let me take that onto my shoulders. I'll bear that shame and that guilt and that sin so that you don't have to. And not just for that one thing, but for everything you've ever done that is wicked and evil and against God. And not just for everything you've ever done, but for everything I've ever done and thought and said. And for everything anybody in all of human history has done that will end up trusting in Jesus. All of that on the cross was piled upon his shoulders all of our iniquities were put on him and he paid the price for it and what's more did you see he did it willingly he wasn't forced to do it so verse 7 to 8 he was oppressed and afflicted yet he was silent there's no complaining he doesn't justify himself he doesn't try and squeeze out of it like a lamb is willingly led to his death jesus goes but unlike a lamb he's not confused about what's coming he knows exactly what's coming and yet he faces it anyway he was cut off from the land of the living, verse 8. He died for your sin and for my sin. The servant Jesus willingly takes what is ours. And he's totally innocent, verse 9. None of it is his. He's void of sin. He's the only one who's ever perfectly lived for the Lord. And yet he dies a criminal's death for the wicked. It's astonishing. And verse 6, look, verse 6 is amazing. It's right at the heart of our passage, verse 6. And actually, I can't really read it without almost singing it. So there's a kid's memory verse, and I find it really hard not to sing it when I read it out. If you'd like to know the song, I can sing it to you afterwards, but I won't do it, I won't do it now. But let me read it. It says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Ba, ba, do, ba, ba. No. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. You see, Isaiah is casting our minds even further back before Christ to a day called the Day of Atonement. You can read, it, read about it in Leviticus 16, but here's, here's, here it is in a nutshell. The priest would get a goat and would put his hands on his head and confess the people's sin, Sym symbolic, putting the sin onto the goat. And then the goat would be led out of camp as far away as possible from the people. What's the image? The image is the people's sin is being removed forever from them well, look, on the cross it is like god is doing that with jesus for us like he's putting his hands on jesus head putting our sin onto jesus who deals with it and dies for it and takes it away forever 2 corinthians 5 verse 21 says this god made him who had no sin to be sin for us the innocent servant, the innocent Jesus bears our sin. 
He takes our punishment, and that means it's removed from us forever. What a swap. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to receive it and hold on tight to it? Or are you going to reject it and say, actually, I think I'll take that on myself, which you can't, by the way. Jesus has died in your place, taking God's wrath at sin away so that you can be free to have a relationship with him and his father forever. Receive it. Love it. Hold on as tight as you can to the Lord Jesus for what he's done for you. And if you have already, don't forget what he's done for you. There's a verse in the Bible that says, this is love, right? It says, this is love. This is it. That God sent Jesus as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you are ever in doubt about how God feels about you, just have a look at the cross. And you'll see that he loves you so much that he used all of his power to become weak and die in your place. It's astonishing. Grab hold of it, receive it, hold on tight. Well, look, finally, finally, very quickly, compared to the other two, verse um, five in this little song, just the last three verses, 53, 10 to 12. And we're going to see that God's righteous servant will save many. See, none of this is an accident. Do you see that in verse 10? It is the Lord's will. We've already seen that the servant was willing. He went without complaining. It is the eternal plan of God, Father, Son, and Spirit to save. That he would put all the weight of all sin onto Jesus' shoulders. And have a look at verse 11. It, it worked. Let me read verse 11. After he suffered for his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. See, Jesus died, but he wasn't finished. The servant rises again to life to save many. Let's have that 2 Corinthians verse up because we didn't read all of it. It carried on. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, Jesus bears our sins away. I've lost where I am. Bears our sins away, but he then clothes us with his righteousness, his perfection, his right relationship with God. So our sin is gone and we're clothed with Jesus' perfection. So now when God looks at us, we are justified. It's just as if we'd never sinned. As we're clothed in Jesus, we are welcomed in to a relationship with God now and forever and ever and ever in his perfect heaven. And how does Jesus feel when he sees that? When he sees people coming to trust in him? Have a look at verse 11. He is satisfied. That's cool, isn't it? Jesus is delighted when sinners see his death on the cross and they see it as God's mighty power to save. He is delighted when he sees people accept his death in their place, when they grab hold of it and they hold on tight. He is delighted when the unrighteous trust him and then are clothed in his perfection. And that has been true for millions of people in the last 2,000 years that have seen the cross for what it is, that have hold on tight to Jesus and are now safe in a relationship away from God's wrath forever and ever and ever. And it can be yours too. I had a great line as I was reading a commentary, just we'll sort of finish with this. And a guy summed up the whole chapter by saying this. He says, we wander away as stupid sheep. Do you remember that verse six? But through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are brought home as perfected sons and daughters. We wander as sheep, we're brought home as perfect sons and daughters. That is beautiful. And Jesus says it's for you. Come and claim hold of him. We're, in a minute, we're about to have communion. And I don't know about you, but on a Sunday morning, communion is very easy to be missed, right? In a minute, I've got four kids that are going to come screaming back in through those doors. 
and then we come up for communion, and who knows what I'm thinking. But can I just encourage you to take a moment to marvel at what we're about to do? We're about to remember that Jesus' blood was spilt for us. We're about to remember that his body was torn apart, not for his sin, not for his wrongdoing, but for mine and for yours. Why? Well, to bring us home as perfect sons and daughters. Take time now to marvel at what is happening when we remember communion and we remember Jesus' death in our place. Let me say a prayer. Let me say a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for what you've done for us on the cross. We thank you that you would willingly go and take what is ours and pay for it to free us and bring us home. Help us to receive your gift, to hold on tight, that we might know love and safety like we never have before. Help us to marvel at the cross again this week. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.